Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Hello again, folks. So yesterday, or last night, um, I recorded a 40-minute video here, and it was it was not about music. It was a whole lot of personal stuff. And I just had some stuff I wanted to talk about, things that have been going through my mind lately. And um, it was fairly energy draining at the end of 40 minutes. And um, when I clicked the button to finish the recording, guess what happened? Blank screen. Um, so what happens on this is when you're done recording, you click the stop record button and then you get a little thumbnail of your video and it shows you the length of the video and just a random shot from the video. If for some reason it doesn't record, you just get the basically a blank screen with the name of the video camera company on it with no length, you know, zero for the length of the video. Now that never happened until recently that that would happen that I would record a video click the you know stop record button and all of a sudden blank screen nothing like the video just erased I don't know I can't I'm not technical enough to troubleshoot this I'm sure it's a software it's gotta be a software issue um, but the first time it happened I just went in and I deleted some of my old videos uh, some old things that I had recorded on here even though the computer is nowhere near its capacity um, it's only about a third full of uh, in terms of space but it worked after that so I kinda went back to recording videos and guess what happened <laughs> so I figured well uh, I've done the last couple of videos they've come out okay so I'm yapping on and I'm talking about stuff that that's been going on uh, personal stuff I didn't mean for it to be a 40 minute video, it just ended up being a 40 minute video. And when I clicked end, it just, I got the blank screen. So don't know, don't know why that's happening. Uh, this is an old Windows 7 computer, it doesn't get updates. My main newer computer is a Windows 10 computer that constantly gets updates. That one's in the main part of the house where, where I normally record my videos on. Uh, it, when it's not decent weather, when it's winter. Um, and something happened to that camera as well, but I'm fairly sure that has to do with the constant updates of the awful Windows 10 software. Um, and that computer's been crashing as well, and it's less than two years old. Um, so, and I'm, I'm sure it's got to do with, with Windows, Windows 10 stuff. Windows always rolls out their stuff too early, and there's always issues with it. And um, I, I think it gets worse every time. I've heard worse things about Windows 10 than I did about the previous versions of Windows. And they never seem to run smoothly. And unfortunately, that's what the computer shipped with, because it's new enough. Um, so I would revert back to an older version if I could, if it were possible. Anyway, so, you know, I gave a lot of thought to regurgitating this whole 40 minute video. And, uh, you know, it, it's probably of extremely limited interest to most people. And to be honest, it took a lot out of me, uh, energy-wise. You know, mentally, just going over what's been going on for the last week or so. Um, uh, you know, me thinking about my old, my old town where I used to live and the people in it and... and uh, you know those those types of things. Uh, I don't I don't know if I could do it again. I, I certainly I don't think I could do it today. So um, what I thought getting back to maybe a more reasonable length video. Oddly, I'm st I've still been in the for the most part the the summer mode of uh, acoustic music. So I don't have a whole lot to report as as far as my listening habits changing. Um, and I, I spoke about in the past how I make uh, MP3 discs, uh, you know, burnable CDs 
for my for my car. And at the bit rate that I crunch down the MP3 files for, I get about eight and a half hours worth of music on one disc, which is great. So if you have a car that plays MP3 discs, you can stick a disc in there and just, you've got eight and a half, half hours of stuff and you're not switching discs every 40 minutes or something. It's really great. Um, and a lot goes into me recording those discs. What albums do I put on there? What I always pretty much put only one artist on a disc, uh, with very rare exception. Uh, so then I pick that artist and I figure, okay, what albums do I include and not include and what order do I put them in? So usually it involves weeks of listening to the specific artists to figure out what albums am I going to put on there, which ones I'm going to leave out, what order do I put them in, blah, blah, blah. So um, I've been kind of, and, and sometimes it takes months to make a single disc. But with eight and a half hours worth of music on there, I could have that disc in and since I'm not working and I don't do a lot of driving around, it might take me two months to go through the entire eight and a half hours worth of disc, which means you know, in, in the course of a month I might be in the car driving maybe four hours total. Uh, obviously that'll change when I get a job, but um, you know, right now, even without repeating any tracks or any albums, that's a long time for an MP3 disc. I've, you know, I've had them lasting for about two months before I get to the end of them. Um, before I, I, you know, I've heard even all of the tracks even just once. Um, so I've been, uh, no surprise, you can't really see that the top of the album's cut off, but it's another Buddy Rich album there. So the, the disc I'm working on now has been Buddy Rich, so I've been playing Buddy Rich for weeks and weeks and weeks now. Um, figuring what albums to put on there, which albums to leave off. There's a couple albums I wish I had that I would include on the disc, um, but I shouldn't be spending money now, but I'm dangerously close to ordering a couple of them, uh, and I should refrain from that. Um, so, you know, I might include a couple lesser albums than the, the, the kind of two that I'm eyeing right now that I really kind of want to get and would like to have on that uh, collection. Um, and in general, I'm not a big band fan, but I just I just like those Buddy Rich things. A lot of them are nostalgic to me. Um, I have one compilation album of his that goes back to the 50s up to, like, it's just various tracks, 1955 to 1961. I haven't really gotten into that, and I listened to that album, but apart from that, I haven't gotten into that period. My stuff with Buddy Rich starts about 1966 on until his passing. Uh, when did he pass away? I think 1987, I think he passed away. Um, and he was playing right up until the end. So from the late 60s on to the 80s, but for the most part, for, for some reason, I don't know, um, I, I've been focusing and most of my recordings of him are from the mid 70s, which would have been exactly the time period I was in high school. I wasn't listening to Buddy Rich when I was in high school, but I didn't know who he was. That wasn't my kind of music back then. Um, and I did probably catch, it might have been after high school though, some of his appearances on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show where he was a regular guest back then when they were originally aired. I've been catching them now because Johnny Carson's show does reruns seven nights a week. And uh, so I've seen a lot of these Buddy Rich appearances on The Tonight Show. So I'm re kind of reliving my own past and they always plop up the date on there so you could see what the what the date was. And you know, in my mind I'm always like, okay, how old was I? What grade I was in? And pretty much a lot, if not most of his appearances on The Tonight Show were during my high school years. At least the ones that they've been re-airing. So they would have been all strictly right in the mid middle 70s. So I've been doing a lot of listening um, to, to Buddy still and um, because I have a quite a few albums of his on CD and I've got a couple on album that I haven't picked up on CD yet um, actually I think it's only one now I think there's only one that I have on vinyl um, that I don't have on CD but I've got others in front of that that I'd rather rather have of his that I haven't picked up yet but I was watching somebody's video yesterday, early yesterday, I think. Yeah, I guess it was yesterday. And they just made a mention in passing of Jan Hammer, which is not somebody that um, 
I really followed that closely, even though I've been aware of him for ages. Um, I'm not sure where I was first aware of him. It might have been him playing with Jeff Beck in the late 70s. And you have to realize, back when I discovered most of the music I'm into, um, the internet didn't exist. So sometimes you had no idea that a guy that had a solo album out may actually have been in a giant band. Um, so I, probably my first exposure to Jan Hammer was him playing with Jeff Beck, uh, his, his fusion era in the, in the late 70s, and a live album he put out. And then maybe slightly after that, not long after that, I came to realize he was in the first incarnation of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, and I think they only recorded three albums, and like a fourth one came out a couple years ago of, of studio stuff that they hadn't released. Um, so the original incarnation of that band, uh, you know, the, the first I heard him play, now that I think about it, was Billy Cobham's Spectrum, which I have only on vinyl, which I bought in the late 70s. That was the first place I heard, now that I think about it, that was the first place where I heard of him. And then I heard him on Jeff Beck, though I'm not, I'm not sure whether I had any of those albums. I think I, I, think I may have. I'm, I'm not 100% sure which Beck albums he played on. I know it was the fusion ones, but I don't know if he played on Wired or not. I, did, I don't think he did. Um, that was the first Jeff Beck album I had. Um, then Beck came out with a live album with Jan Hammer on it. And then I discovered that he was part of Mahavishnu. So I had the Mahavishnu stuff. Uh, which I'm not a I'm not a big fan of. I listened to a lot of fusion for a few years, trying to get into it, and um, gee, most of it just struck me as cold and mechanical. Uh, and I tried hard. I thought maybe I'm just not getting it, but man, I spent a lot of hours listening to that stuff that I never got into. Even after I got into more pure forms of jazz, which somehow resonated more with me, but I think it's because of the tunes. Uh, a lot of fusion stuff is just based around how fast we can play and how fast we can play solos and then how fast we can play in unison and as musical pieces they don't work they don't sound like anything whereas the, the mainstream jazz or more traditional jazz I'm not saying just bebop stuff but more traditional jazz even the ECM stuff seems to be based more on listening to uh, the songs as, as music and not so much te technique. Yeah, it's the, the the pieces are not based around technique. Uh, sometimes they're very avant-garde, or you know, they might be a, a form of avant-garde jazz uh, that's based more on atmosphere or something like that. But um, in general, it's not just a technique-based thing, like somebody showing off because they can play a million notes uh, a minute. Um, so. Somebody, just in passing, they didn't even mention anything about Jan Hammer, but they just mentioned his name. I'm like, oh yeah, gee, Jan Hammer. I got a bunch of him solo things, I think, and they weren't in my new computer, which I bought about two years ago, because it's been lo much, much longer than that that I listened to any Jan Hammer. And I'm like, gee, I kind of have a stack that I think I know where... I just got curious to listen to him, uh, even though it's summertime, and for me the summertime is this acoustic thing um, and I wasn't particularly in the mood to listen to fusion or really electronic music um, because for me it doesn't fit in with the, with the warmer season so much even though I, I know in just a matter of a couple weeks you know we're getting there we're getting toward my favorite time of year we're getting toward autumn we're getting toward Halloween and um, you know, we'll be there soon when the weather cools off as well, and uh, the nights are a little bit longer, and the dusk is beautiful when the sun sets. Um, and for me, that usually starts creeping in with the getting back to slightly more electric music. Um, but simply because this person had made this passing reference to Jan Hammer, and I really haven't listened to a whole lot of electronic stuff lately. I'm like, let me. I think I know where those out. I just got in the mood. I wasn't even sure what I had. So I have one, two, three, four, five albums of his. Now I'm not counting the Mahavishnu Orchestra stuff. Uh, that's more John McLaughlin. Um, 
And some of these albums aren't even done under Jan Hammer's name, but they're essentially Jan Hammer albums. So I took them, I took all five discs and I loaded them in my computer and I listened to them and um, there's some pop stuff on here. Uh, he, he, now the Jan Hammer is definitely a guy that you don't want to blindly buy his albums because he's made some out and out rock and roll vocal oriented uh, albums. So you want to know what you're getting into before you buy, buy them. Thankfully now you can do that kind of research and find that stuff out on the internet. Even if you don't hear the albums, you can read and find out which ones they are and which ones to stay away from because he got into a very commercial thing I don't know in the late 70s or uh, late 80s or so um, so the, the the real rock stuff I wanted to stay away from uh, he didn't do as, as much well the stuff that I have and most of the things I'm, I'm, I'm aware of are not such he, he, I don't think he ever really did on his solo albums, uh, real heavy fusion jammy stuff like like with Mahavishnu Orchestra. Uh, he's definitely done fusion type albums, but they're a little more reined in than the Mahavishnu stuff. So, and I gotta admit, I was surprised because when I looked at some of these, I'm like, yeah, I don't think I like that album. Um, I was surprised, and of course going in with lesser expectations helps. Um, the first one I played uh, which is, um, I guess, not really a Jan Hammer album. It's an Elvin Jones album. So some of these, I'm, save, I'm saving the big hit one for last. Elvin Jones is on the mountain. Um, this is the only Elvin Jones compact disc I have that Elvin did as a leader, though I have some LPs. Most of Elvin's stuff that he did as a leader is much more mainstream and acoustic oriented. The other albums I have, I, I'm pretty sure, are, are a quartet with saxophone, piano, uh, I'm pretty sure it's upright bass, and, and drums, Elvin's drums. Um, so not at all a fusion thing. So this is probably the most fusion album that Elvin Jones ever did. Very interesting group. It's Elvin on drums, Jan Hammer on keyboards, and Gene Perla on bass. Just the three of them. Just three guys. No additional musicians. Um, essentially, it's a Jan Hammer album because he's the guy that plays all the solos and everything. Um, so Jan Hammer wrote, uh, there's six tracks. Uh, pretty sure they're evenly split amongst Jan Hammer compositions and Gene Perla, the bass player who plays upright and electric bass. Now, Gene Pearl is a name that's only come up a couple times. I think he's a studio musician. So I think he's probably a guy that primarily makes a, a living uh, reading charts and, you know, recording music for movies and commercials or whatever. Though his name has popped up on a few albums I have, um, jazz albums, as a supporting player. So he's got a reputation of being a jazz player, uh, and I can't recall where else... I have him, but I'm sure I have him on something else supporting other other musicians. So I don't know if he's a guy that, you know, he's probably classically trained or one of these guys probably that came out of Juilliard or a music school like that and, uh, you know, maybe did some stints in big bands or something, like the Buddy Rich big band is known for all the people I've came through it over the years and a lot of guys that just went on to become studio musicians because it's an easier and nicer way of making a living especially for guys that are jazz musicians. So this is not a bad album. Very interesting. Um, I, I don't recall, I don't think Elvin ever did anything as fusion-oriented as this. And this is from, I think it's from 1975. Um, some of the dates they didn't print on here. This is a one-way records reissue. Yeah, this was recorded in 1975. Which would have been... Um, that would have been uh, right in the uh, Mahavishnu period, or maybe right after Mahavishnu, in terms of Jan Hammer's career. This is an interesting album. Certainly, if you like Elvin Jones, this is uh, quite a departure. Not real surprisingly, though, because Jan Hammer did write half the tunes, and Gene Perla, the bassist, wrote the others. But I like the fact it's just a trio. Everything is played by the trio. Here's another album that is, uh, in name, not... A Jan Hammer album, but essentially is. David Earl Johnson, who is a conga player. 
I'm a little surprised that they gave a conga player ever got a solo contract. You really can't see this as well. But here's um, David Earl Johnson with Jan Hammer. Uh, this is apparently recorded in 1980, an album called Hip Address. And it's just David Earl Johnson on congas and various hand drums, no kit drums, does some singing, um, shakers, kalimba, that kind of thing. Uh, Jan Hammer on keyboards, and even Jan Hammer even plays drums on this. And on about half the album, Jeremy Steig plays various flutes. So I wouldn't say it's exactly a trio because on half of the album, it's just Jan Hammer and um, David Earl Johnson. But uh, again, from 1980, I don't know how many albums David Earl Johnson came out as a solo artist with. Um, yeah, first time I heard of him in an odd place was uh, David Earl Johnson actually played on an Oregon album. I think it was the Friends album from 1977. I'm doing this from memory. But Oregon did an, an unusual album for that band. Uh, they did an album where they had guest musicians come on the album. Uh, a saxophone player was one of them. I think a piano player was one of them, if I'm not mistaken. Larry Koresh, I could be wrong, I think played piano on some of the tracks on the Friends album. And it was various musicians that were associated with Oregon, but the guys in their solo careers more than anything. And David Earl Johnson played congas on the, on the Friends album. And that's probably the first place where I heard of him. That's an unusual and slightly more obscure album from the Oregon uh, catalog. So this one is interesting. It's a, it's a little more fusion oriented. I think there's a, a vocal track on here. Yeah, there's a vocal track on here which doesn't float my boat exactly. But um, it's an interesting album from the time period. I like the fact that it's, it's half duo and half trio. Uh, the Jeremy Stike flute sections are nice when, when he's playing along with the other two guys. I'm a big fan of, of hand percussion and I'm a big fan of albums that aren't totally reliant on the, the drum kit, but rather are more reliant for their sound on various types of hand percussion and, and shakers and things like that. So I mean, this isn't a classic classic, but it's, it, it's an enjoyable listen. And this was a, a um, one-way records reissue just like the um, Elvin Jones. I don't know if these two are in print now because I bought these quite a, quite a long time ago. Um, interesting album. Now we get to the three that I have that are actually under Jan Hammer's name. The first one um, I just learned about and I, I read that this was his first solo album. I don't know if that's 100% correct but um, and this is the best out of the batch folks. It's called the first seven days and it's an instrumental concept album that Jan Hammer plays everything on so it's all all Jan Hammer on keyboards and this was recorded uh, mid 70s I'm not sure but it's a, it's a concept album of Jan Hammer musically um, recreating the birth of, of the the, uh, the earth and the planet and everything and I'm wrong, it was actually, it looks like it was recorded in 1975, but it's not completely solo like I thought it was. Then when you listen to it, I wasn't really that, a, yeah, recorded in 1975. I wasn't really aware. I have to listen closely. Uh, David Earl Johnson plays congas on there, just like, I guess they had, they had a friendship for a number of years. Uh, David Earl Johnson plays congas on two of the seven tracks. And violinist Steve Kindler, which I completely forgot about, actually plays on four tracks on violin. And I guess listening to it, I kind of, I kind of miss that, but the the violin parts. And I think that maybe because the, the there's so many different keyboard sounds coming out, I may have thought that the violin that I'm hearing was one of Jan Hammer's keyboards because he plays acoustic piano, electric piano, etc., etc., uh, mellotron. I guess, uh, and he plays percussion as well. He wrote all the pieces. This is my favorite thing that he's ever done. And I had read, I was surprised. I, I you know, he's from Prague. I thought he had a solo album out before he even came to America, but I guess I'm wrong. Um, this is my favorite thing that he's ever done. It's not really fusion. Um, gee, if it came out now, it would be considered new age, but not necessarily the, 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 the mellow, mellow new age. 
uh, it's mellow at times and a bit more up tempo at other times. But it would probably be thrown into that category if it had come out now, except this is 1975. Now, think about it, pretty good year for music. Isn't that when Klaus Schultz's Time Wind came out? And this is good, especially if you're a fan of keyboards, obviously. But if you're a fan, like I am, of 1970s analog keyboards, and I just read that there's a Mellotron on here. I didn't realize it, but I was hearing a lot of old 1970s keyboard sounds that I love. As a matter of fact, this is what I'm going to be listening to again tonight. It's a short album. I don't need maybe 40 minutes. Um, but again, this is the LP era. None of these albums that got reissued got any extra tracks on them when they were reissued. Um, I hope this is a print. This is a really good album. This would be V1 for people that know my taste and have similar tastes. This would be the one out of all the ones I'm showing to pick up. This is a good album, especially if you like that, that those, those 70s analog synths. A little bit of hand percussion on a couple tracks. Uh, Steve Kindler's violin, which I'm going to have to listen more closely for because with all the keyboard sounds, I, I think I just thought the violin was just another keyboard when I heard it. This, this, this one is, is, is top, top of the pops. Now we're getting more toward things that you may have probably heard of um, that were in the in the popular vein of in terms of well-known things, not in terms of uh, pop like in the, the rock things that he did, but um, Beyond the Mind's Eye, which is from the 1990s. Um, I hate when they put the year in, in Roman numerals, which they did, so now I can't figure out what year it was. I doubt the recording information is in here. Was this in the 90s? I can't tell. I'm guessing late 90s. Um, I know that the Mind's Eye was a... Why do they use Roman numerals? Man, that just pisses me off. Um... The Mind's Eye was a series of, of uh, videos that were like high-tech animated videos, and they got um, fairly well-known composer keyboard players like Jan Hammer to do the soundtracks. And this was, I think, the second one in the series. This is called Beyond the Mind's Eye, and the first one was just called The Mind's Eye. I don't know how many there were in the series. Um, but this is pretty good. Um, not a lot of long tracks on this, and there's a couple, um, a couple like two vocal tracks. I think there might be like 14 or 15 tracks. There's a lot of tracks on here, and um, the vocal tracks are obviously much more closer to a pop thing. But there's enough uh, other other instrumental tracks on here, some up-tempo, some more ballady, to make it a worthwhile listen. I guess because it's a video soundtrack, none of the tunes are particularly long. I think the longest one might just hit five minutes. Um, and some could have definitely been stretched out a lot longer. Not bad. Honestly, the, the, like the two vocal things on here strangely sound much more dated than the rest of the material. Because that's closer to a pop music thing than at that point. Now this one, everybody would have heard of. I might be even surprised that I even own it. But it's Miami Vice. And it's called The Complete Collection. Now this came out in 2002. It's a two-disc set. Apparently the first disc was uh, Jan Hammer's music for Miami Vice television show. Not a show that I would ever watch or ever did watch. Um... But if you were around at the time, you were aware of it because it was a huge, huge, huge hit show, just like Friends would be, or um, the hell is that program now? The, the, I can't even think of the name of it. You know, all these, all these network programs that I would never watch that are huge hits. Uh, the second disc was um, music that he wrote that never, um, he wrote for the, the TV show that never really uh, came out on disc. It was used in the show, but it hadn't come out on a, been released before. I think there's over two hours in here. I think each disc is over 60 minutes. Um, and probably, 
I don't know, when, when you hear the, the theme, the Miami Vice theme is on here, you might, you probably know it. I mean, gee, I never watched the show and I knew it somehow. Um, and uh, you'd be surprised. It, it, there's not as much pop stuff as I expected there would be. Now, I did listen to this when I first got it, which was years ago. Um, and kind of not expecting much because I figured the, the way that was a popular show, I figured that a lot of the music, and this is the late 80s, so it's a very 80s centric digital sound. Um, I always kind of thought that the music would kind of reflect more of a, a pop rock thing. And it does at times, but there's some really good pieces in here. And the only frustrating thing of it is, because it's a TV soundtrack, just like movie soundtracks, there's no long songs on here. Uh, everything is pretty much between two and three minutes. Sometimes shorter than that. Sometimes under two minutes, I think. Um, yeah, this thing's under two minutes on here, or just at two minutes. And there's definitely pieces... How many pieces are on here? There's uh, 42 pieces on here. So fairly short things. Um, a lot, like I said, a lot in the, the two and a half, three and a half minute range. Definitely a lot of things that if they had been recorded for an album of just music and not to accompany a TV show, would definitely have been stretched out longer, deservedly. There's some really nice themes on here that you wish, oh, don't end, don't end, and it ends, um, with very little repetition that you know if these themes had been written for a, just a solo album that they would have been five or six minute pieces and you know you, maybe you go into it expecting well this is late 80s you've got that that synthesizer sound the sample digital drum sound which can make you cringe at times I think only because it's mixed too loud because I've got albums from the early 80s uh, mid 80s late 80s that do have that sampled drum sound and it works on them because they didn't mix them too loud. If they don't try to put the drums in your face, that gated drum sound in your face, uh, and it's more a part of the music, of supporting the music as a rhythm rather than a Phil Collins in your face drum sound, um, it can still work. So I think there's a mixture of that, you know, maybe um, times when the drums, the digital drums are a bit too loud, probably during the up-tempo pieces. Uh, and then other times when they're there, but it works, it's okay, because it just blends in with the music. So this is surprisingly good. Um, I was really shocked and surprised because I thought, mm. I didn't listen to this a whole hell of a lot, but that's because at the time I was probably buying a, a ton of albums. So it's quite a diversion for me listening to Jan Hammer yesterday. And going back to it, the first seven days is really a winner. I'm certainly going to listen to that. I'm, I'm probably going to give all. I'm probably going to play all of these tonight at some point, or at least start to. Um, so this is my pick for the best of the bunch. And this did. I don't know when the CD came out. Probably, um, I don't know, late '90s. Hopefully, it's still available. That's a good one for you analog synth fans, and, and even though it's a very short album. Um, Okay, I didn't mean for this video to run this long. Fingers crossed that when I hit stop record, it doesn't disappear into, into the ether. Uh, if it does, uh, I really don't want to have to film on my broken iPad, but I will if I have to. And maybe again, I'll, I'll try to do that, that personal video where I'm talking about stuff uh, that's been going through my mind in the last week that I recorded yesterday that just took a lot of energy to do and losing it was was pretty upsetting so I'm just gonna say bye and hit the uh, finish recording and, and hope it, it works otherwise I will be back soon take care everyone tune in next time for more tales from the garage